When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he asked her thought-provoking questions. But he did something like this. He said to her, if you drink of the water that I give you, you'll never be thirsty again. And that's what you and I need to do sometimes with people. We need to talk to them in such a way that they're thirsty for that living water. Now, let me tell you my Trump evangelism. Three days ago, I was on a plane coming to LAX, and a guy next to me, I didn't know he was Catholic at the time, but we started talking, and I just tried to find any conversation to move in a spiritual direction, and he started talking about Trump, Donald Trump. And whenever you talk about Donald Trump, do you know what issue comes up? Sin. All of Donald Trump's sins in his past. And I realized at that moment, I had an opportunity to move to the gospel. Because I said to this man, I said, well, you know, there's only one person that's lived a life without sin. And we all know who that is, don't we? And I looked at him like, <laughs> and from his reaction, it was like, yeah, he knew who that was. He said, oh, I'm light Catholic. I'm a light Catholic. And so we had a spiritual dialogue. So I'm saying that wherever you are, God can use your normal conversations and move them in a spiritual direction. And I want to teach you tonight a paradigm that will help you to practice this on a daily basis for the rest of your life. Amen? Now, please understand, I'm not saying this is the only tool. I'm just saying it's one of the tools that you should use in your tool belt. Now, before we get into talking about the model I want to teach you, I want to talk about, for a few minutes, the role of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit has the great role in evangelism, right? You know, the thing that you and I need to understand is that you and I are just the instruments. <clears throat> I love this verse, 1 Corinthians 1.27. It says, God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Who are the weak things? Well, I know I'm pretty weak. In fact, if you were to ask me 15, 20 years ago, David, would you be doing what you're doing today? I would have said to you, you're absolutely crazy. I hate speaking in public. I'm afraid of people. You know, this is not me. This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And yet, God called me to do this all over the world. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. God doesn't call us to do something unless he gives us the ability to do it. Amen. You may not feel qualified to be a witness in your circle of influence, but if God has called you to be a witness, he will empower you to be a witness. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. We just need to get to the point where we're saying, God, I'm willing to be used. Honestly, I've never felt called to do anything I never felt qualified to do anything that God has called me to do. But I've been obedient to do what God has called me to do. And I have opportunities now. I travel in Asia, and I train in different seminaries every year. And I teach professors how that they can be more effective. God has opened so many doors for me, but yet I'm just this weak vessel. But you know what? Doesn't that feel good to know that it's really God who's doing all the work? Amen? All right. So what I'd like you to do is, when you got in here, you got a little bookmark. Did you see this? I want you to take it out, because I'm going to teach you what's called the listen paradigm and the five planks tonight. If we have time, I'm going to teach you both. So, and this is a pre-evangelism methodology that you can use for the rest of your life. And it all begins with the acrostic listen. And each letter stands for something. In fact, the first thing I want to teach you 
is this word, listen. What you and I need to do is hear what people actually believe. In other words, the most important thing I can teach you about pre-evangelism in the world we live in today is to listen more. You see, as, a, as evangelicals, we're great on proclaiming the good news. We're not so good on listening, are we? Do you remember when you were a child, your mother saying something like this to you? Are you listening to me? I remember that. Do you know why? I didn't always hear what my mother was saying. And a lot of times we don't even hear what our non-believing friends are saying. Now here's why listening is so important. If you and I don't listen to people, we're not going to understand what they're saying to us, correct? If we don't understand what they're saying to us, we may not understand where they're coming from. And if we don't understand where they're coming from, we may not know the best way to actually share the good news with them. Does that make sense? So it all starts with listening. Remember what James 1, 19 and 20 says. My dear brethren, take note of this. Everyone should be what? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, how is it that you and I can become a better listener when we don't listen so well, especially us men? Have you ever noticed that? Sometimes as men, we don't listen. We don't listen to our wives. For example, can you imagine... If my wife said to me, I want you to go pick up the children at 2 o'clock, and I thought she said 3 o'clock, who's in trouble? I'm in big trouble. So one of the things that I've learned in my marriage relationship that is also helpful in witnessing is this principle of reflection. I don't hear any wives saying amen. We want to reflect back what our wives or our significant others are saying to us, right? And so what we should say when we're talking to our non-believing friends is, now what I hear you saying is this, or tell me if I've heard you correctly, you're saying this. And so this is one way you and I can learn to be a better listener. Now, as men, if we're married, this is a great way to help our marriages, isn't it? And I've learned that it's something I have got to continually do all the time. So that's the first part. Listen. All right? Can you remember that? Because I'm going to ask you about this in question and answer time. Listen. And then secondly, now we're going to look at each letter. The first letter is L, and it stands for learn their story. What do I mean by that? Learn where people are in their spiritual journey. You see, we are all on a spiritual journey to the cross. And some people are closer to the cross than others, but we're all on a spiritual journey. It reminds me of a famous quote by Pascal, who said something like this. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. What Pascal was saying is that people try to fill their lives with all these kinds of things. And yet, ultimately, it's only Jesus Christ that ultimately will fulfill our hearts. Amen? I remember one day talking to a student on a college campus after 9-11. He wasn't a believer, but here's what he said to me. He said, I realize, David, that now my life has got to count after 9-11 that I can't just work nine to five, that my life has to be a part of something bigger than myself. Now, he may not have realized it, but he was on a spiritual journey. In fact, Solomon talks about this in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Listen to this. He has also set, what? Eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. So remember, we want to listen to people, and then we want to what? Learn their story. Now, how can we uncover where people are spiritually? How can we learn their story? I'd like to suggest to you there are three steps that you and I can take to learn people's story. First, we want to ask questions about what's important to them. When I'm talking to my neighbor, I know 
that my neighbors care about their kids. They care about their jobs. Some of my neighbors care about their grass. So guess what I talk about? I talk about their grass. Wow, your lawn looks great. What do you, what do, you do to make it look so great? Is it because I, I just, I'm really into lawns? Well, I am, actually. <laughs> but I'm more trying to build interest to the gospel. You see, I think we need a new paradigm. We don't tell people to come to the cross and understand Christ from our perspective. We find out what they're interested in and then relate the gospel to their interest. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm suggesting? So I want to ask questions about what's important to them. I'll ask something like this. I'm curious, what, what motivates you get, to get up every morning other than to get a paycheck or to go to school? What turns your crank? So that's the first kind of question. And sometimes just by asking those questions to your neighbors, you can find out a lot about them, and then that might help you to know what your next question might be that will help build bridges in a spiritual direction. Does that make sense? Okay, secondly, you want to ask questions about purpose and meaning. Purpose and meaning. It's very important to ask questions about purpose and meaning because it helps people to think deeper about their life. You can ask a question like this. Maybe even try this out. Do you think it's possible that you and I are put here on this earth for some kind of purpose? Just try this question this week. Do you think it's possible that you and I are put here on this earth for some kind of purpose? If so, what do you think that is? <laughs> I gotta tell you this funny story. I was in Hawaii. I was doing some training for the Southern Baptists in Hawaii. And before that, I had a, a little bit of time. We were on the beach just relaxing. And a young man came up to me. Hi, he said to me. Where are you from? You know, he started talking to me, asking me all these questions. And I thought to myself, this must be a divine appointment because people just don't come up to you and start talking to you that don't know you, right? So I'm always sensitive to the Holy Spirit. People start talking to me, there may be a reason. Finally, he took a breath of air and they stopped asking me a question. And so I asked him this question. I looked him right in the eye and I said, do you ever feel like you've been placed here for some kind of purpose? And you should have seen his eyes. He looked like he saw a ghost. And then he pointed to a church and said, see that church over there? That's my church. You see, I was saved from alcohol and drugs a few years ago. But I gotta be honest with you, I haven't been back to my church in a while. See, God used that question in this young man's life to realize he has a purpose for him and he needs to get back to that church. Amen? You see how just asking this simple question about purpose and meaning can open a spiritual dialogue. Third, here's the other thing. We want to take note of their experiences that have shaped their beliefs and ask them about those experiences. I remember one day talking to an atheist of a student organization on a college campus in the U.S. And I didn't find out later, until later, that this young lady came from an evangelical Christian family. She's a student leader of an atheistic organization. Not just an atheist, she's a student leader. And she grew up in an evangelical Christian family. So what question would you want to ask her? Maybe it would be something like this. I'm just curious about your religious experience growing up. What what motivated you growing up in the church for you to move towards atheism? That would have been my question. So you see how these three kinds of questions can help you to uncover what? Their story. We want to listen and then learn their story. And there are three questions yes, questions about what's important, about purpose and meaning and questions about their religious experience. 
All right, so we've talked about listen, learn their story. The second letter is I. What does I stand for? Invest. Invest, invest time. See, one of the things that's really convicting, still convicts me, is that I need to spend more time with my neighbors. God convicts me, I should say, about that. Because when I come home, wherever I am, I park the car in the garage and shut the garage door, and guess what? I can't even see my neighbor unless I go outside my garage. I have to purposely spend time with my neighbors, spend time with my neighbor's kids, love on them, show them that God cares for them. My son Jonathan is 12 years old. Guess what? When he goes over to his friend's house, the ones that are agnostic, the mom asks him to pray when they have lunch together. See, my kids are already having an impact in my neighborhood. And they know we're Christians. In fact, for a long time, our whole neighborhood, we live on a cul-de-sac, they shunned us from parties and all the things, because they knew we were missionaries. <laughs> so they were kind of staying back, but then they started seeing how much we love them, how much we care about them, and they warmed up to us. But it's taken some time. Do you realize that Jesus himself was a friend of tax gatherers and sinners? Now think about that. Do you think that all that Jesus talked about in his time with them is spiritual things? No. I think he knew something about these people, what they liked, what they cared about, right? He got to know them. So we need to listen. Secondly, learn their story, right? Then what? Invest time in people. Let's go to the next letter, S. What does S stand for? Search for the gaps in their beliefs. Now you say to yourself, what in the world, why is it so important in evangelism to the search for the gaps in people's beliefs? Well, there's a very common misunderstanding that people have about witnessing, and it goes something like this. I want you to understand this point. It's very important. See, there's this idea that all we need to do is love people, okay? Or all we need to do is pray for people. Now, it's a simple approach, but can I suggest, suggest to you that sometimes it's not always true, that that's all we need to do is love people and pray for them? Obviously, we need to do that, but there's more that we need to do. And sometimes we need to help people see this, the gaps in their beliefs before they're actually going to be motivated to take a step to the cross. Let me illustrate this from my own life. One day I was talking to a college student on a college campus, and I asked him this question. Who is Jesus Christ? He said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I said, well, do you believe he's your Savior in any sense? He thought about it for a moment and said, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> like he wasn't quite sure. I said, well, do you think you'll be held accountable for how you live your life? He thought about it for a moment and said, yeah, I probably will. And I said, so how do you measure up? And to my surprise, you know what he said to me? I'm a pretty good person. Now, here's my question to him. Why do you need Jesus to save you? Now, fill in the gap. If you can measure up. He thought about it for a moment, and he said to me this, and this surprised me also, I guess I don't measure you see, I could love him, I could pray for him, but until I begin to help him to see the gaps in his belief system, he may not be motivated to actually take a step to the cross. And that's why helping people see the gaps in their beliefs, we talked about this morning, that's why it's so important. Do you realize, though, this is not a new concept, I'm not teaching you something new, that Jesus practiced this. And the disciples practice this in the New Testament, helping people see the gaps in their beliefs. I want to just share with you one example. Remember in Matthew 19, 16 to 22, when Jesus was speech, uh, speaking to the rich young ruler, and this guy thought that, you know, 
he was perfect, basically. And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. Now listen, when the young man heard this, he went away what? Why was he sad? Because he had great wealth. Now, what were the two inconsistencies that Jesus wanted this rich young ruler to understand? Well, on the one hand, he wanted to understand that he thought he was a good person, and yet Jesus wanted him to understand that he cared more about financial wealth than following Jesus. Now, why didn't Jesus tell this person directly what his problem was? You see, I think Jesus understands very well human nature, and he knows if we don't see it for ourselves, that we may not be motivated to do anything about it. So in this particular situation, Jesus used an indirect approach. But he showed the gaps in people's beliefs. Can you do that? Do you know enough about your faith and to talk to people about their beliefs in such a way that in a very gracious and gentle way, you can help them to see the gaps in their beliefs. Let me illustrate this. One day I had a conversation with my wife's aunt. My wife is a Chinese Singaporean. And her aunt, who's Chinese, has a very interesting view. She believes there's one God, and under this one God, there's many people. There's Buddha for Buddhists, there's Muhammad for Muslims, and there's... Jesus for Christians. So here's the question I asked my wife's aunt when I was trying to witness to her. Why would our God purposely confuse us? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, doesn't the Bible teach in John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12, and 1 Timothy 2, 5 that Jesus is the only way? So then why would there be all these other ways? Now here's what she said to me. You've given me some things to think about. And then she also said, I'm going to try to find something in my religion that does what Jesus does. And then the third thing she did, she let me pray for her before I left. But you see, I helped her see the inconsistencies. But how did I do it? Did I do it in a way that made her defensive? Do you realize how important it is when you're speaking to family members, how you come across to them? You know, this conversation with my wife's aunt could have gone poorly. I could have been in big trouble with her family for many, many years. So I'm saying that we can help people see their inconsistencies, but we have to be sensitive how we do that. Now, don't forget... The most important point, we've been talking about help, helping people to see the gaps in their beliefs. But we need to really listen. Why? Well, sometimes people say they're Christian or they're Buddhist or they're Muslim or whatever, Hindu or whatever their religion is. But the label they use does not match with what they actually believe. I remember after 9-11 one day talking to a student. He said, I don't believe in, in heaven or hell. This is right after 9-11. He said, I don't believe in God or heaven or hell, but I think the terrorists are going to be held accountable in the next life for what they did. How do you figure that one? You see? So it's just because somebody uses a label doesn't mean they really buy into that label. The guy on the plane three days ago said he was a light Catholic. Okay. So what does that mean? <laughs> so that's what I was trying to find out in my conversation with him. And secondly, don't forget to focus on a few sour notes. In other words, when you hear sour notes in someone's belief, like with my aunt. See, with my aunt, I could have asked her a whole bunch of questions, couldn't I? Because her beliefs were really way off the deep end. But I only asked one question. Why would our God purposely confuse us? That's all I wanted to ask her that day. I didn't want to ask her any more questions. I just wanted her to think about that and allow the Holy Spirit to work in her heart. 
So when you're talking to people, and we're not even at the point where we're asking questions, we're just listening to the gaps in people's beliefs. I want you to focus on a few things. You need to point out standout inconsistencies rather than all inconsistencies. Do you know why that's important? Ladies, when I'm having a disagreement with my wife, Charlene, that comes from time to time, do you think I'm going to point out everything she says to me that doesn't make sense? I'm not stupid. <laughs> I'd be sleeping on the couch that night. I just try to talk to her and help her understand the most important things that are important to me. And I leave aside these other things that aren't really that important. Because what happens if I don't, ladies? She's going to emotionally pull back from me. If I keep badgering her with all these things I see are inconsistent in her statements. It's not very nice, is it? Can I suggest to you it's not very nice when we as Christians do that using apologetics? We badger people. We tell them this is where you're wrong. This is what you need to believe. We should care more about their soul care more about reaching them than whether we're right and they know we're right. Amen? T, that's the next one. So listen, learn their story, invest time, search for the gap, and T stands for throw light on the conversation. How do you throw light in the conversation? Remember we were talking today about one of the things I want to do is I want to teach you how to take normal conversations and move them in a spiritual direction. Here's where you can start working. Because to throw light in the conversation, we can ask a clarifying question. Like, what do you mean by? So all we really need to do with our non-believing friends is listen and look for those opportunities where we can ask questions about the terminology they use. If somebody says, I'm really not really religious, you can ask them, well, what do you mean by you're not very religious? Or I'm a good person. Or I think all religions are the same. Or the Bible can't be trusted. Or I'm an atheist. Remember the Catholic I talked to three days ago? He said he was a light Catholic. So what do you think my next question was to him? What do you mean by light Catholic? Can you explain that to me? I'm very curious to understand what you mean by that. And we had an interesting conversation. Now, unfortunately, the plane, ju the plane just landed, and so I, I, I kind of lost my opportunity to go further in the conversation. But he seemed to enjoy the conversation that we had. And so my prayer is that God would put another Christian in his life to pick up where I left off. Do you realize that sometimes we can actually burn our bridges with people by how we are overzealous sometimes and share maybe more than we should, than the Holy Spirit wants us to share? I remember one day getting into a taxi in Singapore when I lived in Singapore, and I discovered by talking to the taxi driver that the last Christian that talked to him thought that he was God's last hope to save this taxi driver. So he crammed the gospel down his throat. And so by the time I got to him, guess what? He didn't even want to talk to me about spiritual things. Can we believe in the sovereignty of God to believe that we can plant the seed today, somebody can water it, and then someone else, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can reap the fruit? Can we believe that? Can I encourage you to be sensitive to those opportunities that God may give you. I'll be honest with you, there are times I get on a plane after I've done a long seminar, and I say to the Lord something like this. I'll be honest with you. I say, Lord, I'm tired, and I don't want to talk to anyone about the Lord. I do. I say that. But then I pause and say, but Lord, if you want me to speak to someone, you have them speak to me first. And guess what happens every time I pray that prayer? Can't get them to shut up. Yes, Lord, I'm your servant. 
And so I share with them. I'm saying that there are times I'm tired and I don't want to share, but I'm a servant. You're a servant. That's the important thing. And we'll look back on that and say, I'm so glad that I was faithful to do what God has called me to do, even when my body said no. <laughs> the Spirit of God said yes, and we need to be open to that. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's see what we have so far. Listen paradigm is listen, learn their story. What's the next one? Invest. Don't look at your little bookmark. <laughs> then S stands for? Search for the gaps in their beliefs. And there, by the way, there are four gaps. And we don't have time to talk about this. So I encourage you to learn this. The four gaps are belief versus heart longing, belief versus behavior, belief versus belief in illogical belief. But it goes a little deep, all right? So we're not going to talk about that tonight. But there are four different gaps or sour notes that you can hear someone's belief. So then once we search for the gaps, then what's the next thing? T. Throw light on their belief. How do we throw light on their belief? By asking the question like, what do you mean by? Do you realize that you and I can be more effective in pre-evangelism if we do two things? If we listen better and clarify the questions that people use in our conversations with them. Those two things. This week, can I encourage you to do that? Listen and ask clarifying questions to your non-believing friends or your religious friends that go to church. E stands for what? Expose the gaps in their beliefs. You see, like a musician, I'm a musician, we want to hear our notes, right? As an artist, what do we want to do? Next slide. We want to paint a picture to help people see themselves in a more clear light. Do you realize that when you and I ask thought-provoking questions, in a sense, what we are doing is we are holding up a mirror and helping people to see themselves more clearly. See, that's what a question, a thought-provoking question, will do. It will operate as a mirror and help people to see themselves in a more true light. Now, how do we do this? Well... We want to expose the gaps by asking questions, questions that surface uncertainty and expose false beliefs. And we begin by asking probing questions. Now, here are some probing questions that I have used in my conversations with people for many, many years. And these are the ones that I go to. If I'm on a plane or, I mean, if I just meet someone, I, I, I don't even know them, um, you know, I, I just run across some people and we start talking for some reason. I would ask questions like this. Here are some helpful phrases. I'm curious to know. Have you noticed that I like that one? I use that one a lot. See, I could say to them something like this. You know, why would you believe something so stupid? That's not very nice, is it? But I... But when I say things and preface it by saying, I'm curious to know something. I remember yesterday we were talking and you said this. Today you said this. I'm curious, how do you put these two together in your own mind? You see how one kind of encourages defensiveness and one that discourages defensiveness? I would encourage you to learn to talk in a way to minimize people's defensiveness. I'm curious to know, would you agree? Have you considered? Did you know? How is it possible? And these are the phrases that I use apologetically when I add apologetics to my questions. For example, I'm curious to know, is there anything in your life that helps you cope with difficult times? Can I encourage you? to try a question like this. You see how easy that one is? I'm curious to know, is there anything in your life that helps you cope with difficult times? You see how non-threatening that question is? Now, obviously, you can't ask that question to someone that doesn't feel quite comfortable with you, right? That doesn't really know you, and you know them very well. 
Would you agree that there is more evidence for an intelligent designer today than, say, 20 or 30 years ago? I remember I asked that question specifically. I was on a plane talking to a Chinese atheist. And he would not admit anything I had to say. And the final thing I said is, would you at least agree that there's more evidence now for an intelligent designer than, say, 20 or 30 years ago? He said, maybe. That's all he said to me, maybe. <laughs> now, if he's willing to admit that there's an intelligent designer, look at your five planks. Turn, turn, turn over to the five planks. See. If you and I, if someone is willing to admit that there may be a creator, guess what? It's a lot easier to get them to take steps to the gospel. Why? Because if there is a creator, it's easier for you to make the point that I am accountable to my creator in some way. Would you agree with that? If you can get them to admit that there is a creator, you can make the case for, I am accountable to my creator in some way. And what I've discovered is, once you get someone to admit that they're accountable to their creator in some way, it's easier then to eventually get them to admit that they're a sinner. And if you can get them to admit that they're a sinner, guess what? It's easier to get them to admit that they need a See, you're fast learners. You're really fast learners. And if I can get someone to admit that they're a sinner, then maybe I can get them to see that they need an outside source for help. And if I can get them to admit that they need an outside source for help, then maybe I can get them to see that they need what only Jesus can provide. You see how that works? But you see where apologetics comes in? Number one, plank one, I'm accountable to my creator in some way. If someone's not willing to admit that there is a creator, then it's hard then to get people to take those steps that we want them to take, right? Here's another phrase. Did you know? Did you know? I talked about this in the men's retreat on Saturday. I talked about the four and the three. Do you know what the four and the three is? Does anybody here remember what I said about that on Saturday? What's the three things that prove that Jesus is God? He lived a sinless and miraculous life. He what? Fulfilled prophecy written hundreds of years before he ever existed. He died on the cross and rose from the dead. That's the three. What's the four? There are four things that even many non-Christians believe concerning Jesus that strongly suggest who he is, that he was who he claimed to be. And they are, he died by crucifixion. He was placed in a tomb that was empty three days later. That a number of people claim to have seen him after the resurrection. A large number of disciples claimed to have seen him after the resurrection. And fourth, do you remember what the fourth was? His disciples were willing to die for that belief. And what I said on Saturday is this. People will die for something they think is true, but unfortunately it's false. But history has yet to record someone who's died for a belief they know to be false. So if the disciples died, they died for something they knew was either true or false but they were closest to him, so they would know whether it was true or false. That's very strong evidence that Jesus really did rise from the dead. They were willing to die for that belief. Jesus' half-brother James, do you know this? Never believed in Jesus until after the resurrection. Now think about this. What would convince you that your brother is God? Had to be pretty strong evidence, don't you think? For me to say that my brother is actually God? There had to be something really supernatural. And then not only he believed it, he was willing to give his life for that belief that his brother was God Almighty. 
That's powerful evidence. You see, the right kind of questions can help people face the truth. So you and I just need to learn how to ask these right questions. Now, why is asking questions so helpful in today's world? Well, I ran across, across this quote from an ex-Jehovah's Witness, David Reed. And listen to what he says, why it's so important to ask questions. He says this, a person can close his ears to facts he doesn't want to hear, but if a pointed question causes him to form the answer in his own mind, what? He cannot escape the conclusion. Why? Because it's a conclusion he's reached himself. See, that's why Jesus used questions. That's why the disciples used questions. And that's why in the world we live in today, it's helpful to use questions. Now, let's finish this up, and then I will give you a chance to ask questions. All right? The last one, the last letter is N. So let's review. The first point is, don't look at your bookmark. Look at me. Listen. Learn their story. Invest time. Search for the gaps. Right? I was trying to see if anyone was cheating. T, throw light under belief. E, okay, and what's N? Navigate. You can see that right there. Navigate by using the three Ds. What are the three Ds? Okay, let me explain to you, in the 30 years I've been traveling and teaching and practicing evangelism, especially on college campuses, what, what I discovered is there's a barometer that I can use to maximize the effectiveness of my questions with young people. I'm not saying it will be effective. I'm saying that I can maximize the possibility of my effectiveness. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I can do it by keeping the three Ds in mind as I'm asking questions. What are the three Ds? Well, I want to ask questions in a way that surface their doubt. Go to the next slide. That minimize their defensiveness, but most importantly, that create a desire for them to want to continue the conversation. Now, has anyone ever learned how to juggle balls? You know, I tried to juggle two balls, and I can do that, but I've been told that's not really juggling. That juggling is not until you juggle at least three balls. Can I suggest to you, for you to juggle these three things, Ask questions that surface doubt, that minimize their defensiveness, and then most importantly, create a desire to continue a conversation. That's not hard. That is very hard to do. It's hard to juggle all three things. But can I suggest to you, if you and I are going to be more effective in witnessing to a certain kind of people, we're going to have to learn how to do that. One of the things that my father and I talk about in our book conversational evangelism, we make this point about leaky boats. And the point goes like this, that people are reluctant to get out of a leaky boat until you provide them a better boat. Have you noticed that? You know what Singaporeans will do? They'll try to plug a hole in the boat or bail the water out of the boat, but they won't get out of their leaky boat until you provide them a better boat. So what I'm saying is, is all we do with people is deconstruct, use apologetics to show what's wrong with their belief. It's not enough. We have to say what's right about Jesus. Amen? Do you see that? If you and I are going to be effective in this kind of world today, we're going to have to create a desire on their part to either want to hear more about Jesus or to continue the conversation. I remember one day talking to a young man who was having problems in his marriage. And to be real honest, he was having problems being faithful to his wife. And here's what I said to this young man. I said, God can help me to be faithful to my wife. Because Philippians 2.13 says that God is at work in us to will and work his good pleasure. Now, why do you think he wants to talk to me about the Lord? Because he wants to save his marriage. He realizes he's in trouble. I'm saying find out what would make your non-believing friends desire to continue a spiritual dialogue with them. Find out what that is. Find out what that would mean. 
and then ask the Holy Spirit for direction in the conversation. Listen, L-I-S-T-E-N. Okay, I want you to understand, here's how we can move from pre-evangelism to evangelism. You see, what I said before about if I can get someone to admit that they're accountable to a creator, I find it's a lot easier to get them to admit that they're a sinner. See, the problem is it's hard to share the gospel with people today because they don't want to admit that they're a sinner. But if there is a God, and there's good evidence from science and philosophy that God exists, then we are accountable, or people can see how they're accountable in some way. I remember one day I was on a plane from Chicago to Japan. By divine appointment, I sat next to a Japanese scientist. And for, for the first 45 minutes, I shared with him both the philosophical and scientific basis for an intelligent creator of the universe. And after 45 minutes, he said to me, wow, there does seem to be some evidence for an intelligent creator. Now, the moment he said this, you know what I did? I moved to the gospel. Why? Because he just admitted the most difficult part, that if there is a creator, then it was easier for me to help him see that maybe we're accountable to this creator. And if we're accountable, then maybe we're sinners, and then maybe we need Jesus Christ. So do you understand how this paradigm, we, we haven't had much time tonight to go, kind of go through the whole thing, but do you understand how these parts go together? The first part under listen is pre-evangelism. The second part is where you get to the evangelism. Can I encourage you to practice this? In fact, in my seminars, my longer seminars, I break people into twos, and I have them practice being a Christian and a non-believer and go through these five planks. So maybe at another time you can do that because that's when you'll really begin to understand how you can begin to integrate apologetics in your evangelism in ways that are fruitful. Amen? Amen.